what's on my agenda here. Um, this talk is sort of about, or it is inspired by, some, some uh, recent work of uh, myself, Steve Addy, Terry Pocand, Emily Neal, who is here, and Christian Fabian, who is here. Um, so, uh, paper is just up on the archive as of a month ago or so, I think, at last. Um, and so, part one of this talk is actually going to be about that, but not really about the solution that's in that paper, but about the problem we're trying to solve. So I want to explain that to you, and then the solution itself is sort of too technical for this audience, I think. Um, and then in part two, I want to say actually something about the solution, but not really about the specifics of this paper. So I'm going to talk about a kind of technique for um, formalizing or describing instructions of the kind we do in this paper um, inside of type theory. So uh, it's, this is sort of about formalization. So if I, if I can do something conveniently in type theory, there are all these type theoretic proof assistants I can use. But I mean, it's also a technique that we can do on pen and paper. Um, so there you go. And what I'm going to talk about in the second part is not really specific to this model, but applies to kind of the line of work that came before it. OK. So part one, uh, what do we want in a model of homotopy type theory? So um, I guess those of you who have been around for a while maybe have heard some talks about that, but let me just recall. Um, very briefly, um, so today when I talk about homotopy type theory, I just mean Martin Love's dependent type theory plus the univalence axiom. So this is a, a dependent type theory with some basic type formers. You have sums, products, you have equality types, you have some universes, maybe some base types like the natural numbers. Um, and the univalence axiom is telling us that uh, an equality between two types inside a universe uh, corresponds to an isomorphism. So there is a isomorphism between these types, one of which is a type of isomorphisms. Um, and so a couple of, of motivating ideas for people who are studying homotopy type theory or working in it, say. Um, first of all, uh, the idea of synthetic homotopy theory, that we do some constructions in this type theory and we interpret them, we read them as being facts about spaces. So um, in particular, kind of the engine of this whole thing is that we in an arbitrary type A, we think of A as a space, and we think of equality proofs between elements of A as corresponding to paths between these elements of the space, these points of the space. Okay, so that is an intuition, and as we're working in say, constructing models of homotopy type theory, we want to kind of make that intuition precise. Um, and the other motivating idea is that homotopy type theory ideally is in some sense constructive. So it's growing out of this tradition of modern love type theory, which is a, a constructive system. And when we move to homotopy type theory by postulating this univalence axiom, at least when we look at it at first, we're still in a, a world without the excluded middle, without choice, and so on. Um, and then there are different ways we could try and substantiate that precisely. Um, make, make precise what we mean by homotopy type theory. So today I'm going to be coming at this all from a kind of perspective of models of thought. Um, and so the first model of homotopy type theory that came around uh, was uh, Vladimir Vygotsky's simplicial model, which was written up a bit later on by Christopher Polkin and uh, Peter Lemstein. So, I mean, this was floating around before 2021, but it was finally published in 2021. Um, so the idea here, and here I'm going to be not very explanatory, but I'm going to get more into details once we switch to a cubicle world, uh, is to interpret uh, the types of homotopy type theory as something called um, common complexes, and these are specific simplicial sets. Um, and I'm simplifying things a bit here by talking about closed types, whatever. Um, and so the intuition for what a common complex is, is that it's a kind of combinatorial representation of a space, which is um, built by connecting a bunch of higher dimensional triangles together. So you maybe have some points, you draw some lines, which are one dimensional triangles, as we know, uh, between them, you put some triangles in, you put some tetrahedron, etc. Um, 
And so here's roughly how the interpretation goes. Again, the, the types become these concomplexes, which are supposed to correspond to spaces in some sense. Um, an identity type becomes a complex of paths, which is supposed to correspond to a space of paths. And equivalence of types becomes somehow like homotopy equivalence, which is the name of something in some special sets of in spaces. Um, so this is, is great from the perspective of this first motivating idea that we should be able to read um, constructions in Hobbes as, as being about spaces because it's like simplicial sets are, or common complexes are well accepted as a model of spaces in the world of homotopy theorists. And like there's a precise result that says that um, this world of simplicial sets, complex, common complexes inside simplicial sets actually corresponds to your friendly topological spaces in a precise way. Um, but for those of us who are interested in constructivity, there's an issue here. So um, Bogotsky's original construction is non-constructive. And in fact, the conclusions that he comes to as he has stated them can't be made constructive. Um, so there's this, I tried to capture three papers here. There's the first one by Basim and Kokan, then one by Basim, Kokan, and Parman, and then one by Parman in these extensive years. Um, where they identify specific obstructions, things that can't be done constructively that are happening in this model. Um, and now there's been some progress on this problem since then. So if you change some of the statements, uh, some of the conclusions that you're drawing in the construction of this model, then it's possible to do things constructively. Um, so these are actually two different approaches to this problem, but both of them have some gaps as far as constructing a full model of homotopy. That theory at the moment. So promising there, but here's another approach. So that was the first model. This is like the nth model. There were plenty in between. Um, a model in cubicle sets, uh, a kind of cubicle set that I like to call affine, but I won't use that word again, so don't worry about it. Um, so this was uh, introduced by Basim, Fukan, and Huber. Um, it's the first paper in 2014, and then some new sends are cleaned up in 2015. Um, so the picture looks pretty much the same as it did on the, the last slide, except that I put the word cubicle in various places. So where before we were using this combinatorial representation of spaces as made of triangles, now we're thinking of them as made of cubes. And maybe I should say squares if I'm saying triangles. So n-dimensional cubes, we again have points, lines, but now squares, three cubes, and so on. And for reasons that are quite subtle, I think, switching to cubes makes things easier from a constructivity perspective. So we can actually do this. Um, I'm not really an expert on different constructive set theories, but like Thierry Kukan understands uh, what set theory he is working in, and he knows it's constructive. <laughs> um, and uh, so if we now, that, that's good for the constructivity side of this question, but if we now go back to the spaces question, um, what are we doing here? So this kind of cubical con complex does correspond to something space-like. And uh, if we're homotopy theorists, we observe that this thing here is a homotopy theory. And I've given some citation for that, but I didn't. Um, and actually, in this case, it's a bit bold, so I won't. Um, so uh, there's this, this concept of a model category in homotopy theory, which is sort of like a, a world of homotopy. And space is this one world of homotopy, but there are other ones. Um, and this one, well, it, it is a sensible world of homotopy theory, but it's not spaces. And so that's a little dissatisfying. And um, Christian was the one who, who came up with the counterexample that shows that this, um, this is not the homotopy theory of spaces. So again, homotopy theorists are interested in lots of different homotopy theories. And if we could find out what this one actually is, maybe it would be interesting. Well, we're not really sure. Um, but in, in any case, for the like, fundamental motivations of homotopy type theory, we really want spaces. Um, and so it turns out that both these kind of constructivity and spatiality being spaces aspects. Question, question. Yeah. I mean, spaces, I mean, a model category is a equivalent model category, right? Yes. And yeah. um, when we say spaces, I, I feel that it's a little bit more um, open. 
So kind of, I, I, I don't know. I'm asking if the, um, what I'm asking is whether the, 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 the kinds of homotopy theory, theories that I uh, described, they, do they kind of fall into this particular um, classes? They have spaces, diagram spaces, spectra, or they kind of f fall into quillen model categories and non quillen model categories? So this one and the standard one both are quillen model categories. Um, these examples are just example, <clears throat> examples. I don't know that this is homotopy theory is any of those things. Okay, so, so, so the one you're saying, but not the standard one, it's still a model category or not? Yes, it's still a model category, but okay. we can show. That, that was the question. Yeah. But just to um, finish the thought, um, it's, we can show that it's Quillen inequivalent. Okay, so um, this talk is going to be about cubical sets. Um, so let's go into a little more detail about cubical sets. Like I said, we want to think of this as a, a space that's built by attaching a bunch of cubes together. So we have, we could kind of stratify this by dimension and say we have a set of one cubes, a set of zero, oh, sorry, zero cubes, a set of one cube, a set of two cubes, and then there's some information about how they're attached to each other. So here's a one cube, but it's not just floating anywhere. It's attached to this zero cube and the zero cube, and the zero cube also happens to be the base of this two cube. Um, and I, I said that we are not looking at all cubical sets, but at these cubical con complexes. And the idea here is that we want to restrict our attention to cubical sets where the edges can be thought of as paths in space. Um, and I mean, this one already kind of looks like a space, but um, the, the paths in this are not single edges, but kind of paths of edges. So if I want to go from here to here, there's no edge directly from here to here. I'm not like suppressing anything, it's just not there. Uh, I would have to follow this one and then this one. Yep. One of the edges is green, does so that mean? Ah, it's because I stole this diagram from a previous green colored talk. Yeah, that mean. Yes. Uh, well, no, it, it, everything was green and I tried to change all the colors, but I missed that one. The, the holes in my talk preparation begin to show through at this point. Um, okay, so um, Daniel Kahn, back in 1955 or something, uh, introduced this Kahn condition that kind of singles out those cubical sets which have uh, are, are space-like in a kind of generalized form of the sense I was I was saying, and um, it's a bit funky when you first see it. Ooh, there's another green thing. Um, what it says is that whenever I see an open box in my cubical set, there should be a way to fill it in. And here, this is a particular case. It's a two-dimensional open box. So I think that this is a filled-in box. That's an open box. And so I had a picture of that open box in my cubical set. And therefore, there should exist something filling it in. And I've, I've drawn that filler in kind of a weird squashed way. And I think that's a, if you want to have some spatial intuition here, that's actually the way to think about it. Because, I mean, it's perfectly fine to have a, a circle in the space. It kind of looks like there's a hole in it. Um, but if I have, say, two paths on that circle, I should be able to, or maybe three in this case, make it look like a box. Uh, it looks like a very strange box. I should be able to form the single path that goes along all of them. And moreover, that path should be kind of the same as the original three, and that's expressed by there being this two-dimensional cube relating them. Um, so that's my best attempt to give you some intuition for this. So the sort of graphically here, what you're trying to say is that this filler is not actually taking up the literal space that was drawn in the diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't actually drawn a line directly from one to the other yeah. because the lines are still what they were, and you really want in this set of lines to act as a cubicle. So right, I really want to think of this path of lines as being a single line. There's a, one single line that kind of lies over all three of them together. Um, it's not so important, but uh, I'm 
working on ways to convey this to people, testing this out. But, hmm? yeah. Maybe following Valeria's uh, questions, so there are the vibrant uh, objects? Or? Yeah, these would be the vibrant objects so yeah. in that category. Yeah. Um, and now, actually, I want something a little bit more general than this, and these will be the vibrations in the model category for those who know. I want a, a relativized version of this condition where I have a map of cubicle sets. So I have a cubicle set up here and a cubicle set down here, and I have a, a function between them in some appropriate sense. Maybe this function is just squashing things vertically. And now, my animations would have been cool if I had, had time to make them. Um, so now the, there's an open box up here on the left. Um, and it lies over a filled-in thing in the bottom here. And um, this filled-in thing happens to be kind of degenerate in one direction, but that's not important. Um, and now I get this fill, filling in my square as I did before, and now I drew it less nicely. Um, but I also get to know that it lies over this filled-in cube that I already had down here in the base. Um, so again, the details of this aren't actually uh, so important. It's just uh, I want to give you this. So this is how I would interpret uh, a type in a context. So this, I can think of a, a type in an empty context as being a cubicle set, or a con complex, rather. <coughs> and if this con complex is my context, then I want uh, a type over it to be a kind of family, which I represent as a map like this. So the, the part of the family at some index is the piece that lies over it here in the map. And, um, and I want that to be a con vibration. So that's how I'll interpret my types. Okay. Um, so that's the, the basics of the original cubicle model. And now uh, more cubicle models, which also fit that pattern more or less, uh, come into the picture. So uh, people started looking at different variations on the definition of cubicle set, um, which have uh, better properties in terms of being models of homotopy type theory. So I'm not going to talk about higher inductive types at all in this talk, but they are better for that. Um, so first there was this um, paper in using De Morgan cubicle sets, and then another using Cartesian cubicle sets. This one is kind of a very maximalist kind of cubicle set, and this one is sort of between the original one and this one. Um, and it's sort of beyond my scope here to talk about why these make a difference. Um, but essentially, they're changing the ways that cubes are attached to each other. So in my original pictures here, I have nothing kind of inside of these cubes. But uh, a distinguishing feature of these later ones is that there's always a, a diagonal edge sitting inside a cube. And that's great. Uh, for some things. But unfortunately, these modified model constructions still don't give us uh, the model category of spaces. So again, we get a Quillen model category associated to this model of type theory, but it's inequivalent to spaces. So that's still sad. Okay. But there's no need to be sad anymore. It's an equivariant cubicle set model of homotopy type theory by people who were on the first slide. Um, so this is, again, working in Cartesian cubicle sets from the, the previous slide. Um, but now with a stronger version of this con filling operation, um, which is not easy to draw on a slide, so I gave up. Um, like I said, I'm not talking much about the solution, just the problem. Um, but the form of open box is more general, and there's a stronger um, uniformity condition. And thought that I wanted to mention that. Yeah, I did want to mention that. Um, but let me finish my thought here, and I'll come back to that. Um, so this is still constructive. I do it all. Um, it's not really any difference as far as constructivity is concerned from the previous cubicle models. But if we allow ourselves classical logic, we can show that this, this Quillen model structure is Quillen equivalent to um, the standard one on simplicial sets. Um, and uh, I am talking always about homotopy type theory today, but if you're aware, there are these cubicle type theories which 
kind of our uh, more computational versions of homotopy type theory where rather than adding a new axiom, we extend with some judgmental features and operations that are inspired by these cubical models. And the equivariant model also justifies an interpretation of cubical type theory uh, in something that's equivalent to spaces. And the, the reason why the word equivariant shows up in here is because this uniformity condition, which I'll come back to, um, has something to do with permutations of these squares. So in the kind of cubical sets we're looking at, um, every square can be uh, permuted along its diagonal, and more generally, cubes can be um, permuted along their diagonals. You can uh, permute the axes of the cube. Um, but again, I won't go into that. Uh, I did want to say something about this uniformity condition. So this is something that came out of um, this research into modeling cubical type theory. It's not something that, to my knowledge, existed in, in homotopy theory. Um, so I've drawn an open box, uh, kind of standard open box over there. But in fact, we want to allow ourselves to feel something slightly more general. Um, we always want a base of the open box, but some of the sides can be missing. Okay? And we still want to have a square like this. So whenever we see a picture like this, we can complete it to a square. Uh, now, an even lower dimensional instance says if I see a point, um, on one end of the line. So if I see a point in here and I have a line down here, then I can extend it to a line up there. So this is a kind of 1D open box. Um, and so if I look at the, the lift that I get here, well, if I start from this shape, there are two ways I could get this line. I could fill in the whole square and look at the edge, or I could use this um, 1D open box to just fill directly the point. Um, and so when we look at models of type theory, we want to require kind of the uniform kind of filling where doing things these two ways gives the same result. And of course, there's a much more general version of this condition. Um, but the, the general principle is if um, you have some open box and then you fill a part of it by looking at that in isolation, it will correspond to what you would have gotten by filling the, the whole open box. So, yeah. yeah. Technically, it means that you have a functorial uh, uh, um, It's. Yeah, there's, it's some kind of. Um, um, it can be expressed as an algebraic weak vector yes, sure. system. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. In, in your example here, you have just two lines and uh, three points, and then you're expanding it to four points. So that means you have to like straight up invent a point in order to produce this, right? Yeah. How are you going to do that in a way that's natural? Um, well, maybe this is something we can talk about after. Um, so, okay, so there's the, the problem and there's a very brief sketch of a solution to that problem. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, one way of describing these models, um, which I'll call internally, um, because it's a reasonable name. Uh, so going back to this paper, it actually has two descriptions of the model that I sketched. Um, didn't even sketch. Um, so the main body of this is what I would call external. It's a very long pen and paper description of the model. I mean, it's long because it has to be. Uh, and um, then after this paper, there's a shorter appendix. And the appendix is shorter just because it doesn't have as much detail as it could. Um, but uh, it's thankfully paired with a formalization. And this is essentially written in a type theory. Um, 
And so the intention here is not just to like switch from doing things in set theory to doing them in type theory, the same thing, um, which is sometimes something interesting to do, but rather um, we don't want to think of the type theory we're working in as corresponding to sets, but corresponding to cubicle sets. Um, so we have a, a model of an extensional type theory, I'll come back to that in a second, in just cubicle sets. And we're going to work inside that type theory and carve out a model of homotopy type theory in the con complexes inside that world. Um, and the, the idea here is that by working inside this language of cubicle sets, we'll cut down on some bookkeeping. And that was in particular why I wanted to bring up this uniformity thing, because this is something that becomes basically invisible um, when we describe these um, definitions of vibration and kind of complex inside the internal language. And a side benefit of doing things this way is that it's well suited to formalization in a proof of system. So I think all the um, formalizations in this style have been done in Agda, um, and this approach was pioneered by Orton and Pitts, uh, who did a formalization for the De Morgan cubicle set um, type theory, or something a bit more general, but in the spirit of that one. Um, this one whose authors appeared on a previous slide uh, is for the Cartesian cubicle set model, and then there's another one whose author names I should have spelled out. One of them is me, uh, Andes Marbury and Andrews Wan. Um, so first, let's go back to extensional type theory. So this is a type theory with a, a strict equality, and it can be interpreted in locally Cartesian closed categories, whatever that may happen to mean. The point here is that cubicle sets are an example, and in fact, we can kind of describe the model more directly in this case. Uh, and the idea here is we interpret a context of the extensional type theory as a cubicle set, a type as a, a cubicle set lying over a context via some map. So this is sort of similar to the confibration picture I had here, but we're not asking for any lifting conditions. Um, and then a element will be a section of this map. And importantly, we're going to interpret um, proofs of equality as strict equality. So this is definitely not homotopy type theory. Um, but now we're going to start modeling homotopy type theory in extensional type theory. And the idea is that we're going to interpret um, a context of our homotopy type theory as a, a closed type in the extensional type theory. We'll interpret a type in homotopy type theory as uh, a family of types over the context plus some extra information. And this is going to be the filling operation, the con condition, or the operator that implements the con condition for this type. And then an, an element of the type is just going to be uh, sort of the same kind of thing as it would be in an extensional type theory. So it's just some a family of elements of um, the family underlying this vibrant type, as I might call it. Okay. Um, this is the present tense. So now we can go ahead. Uh, well, okay, we can't go ahead yet. But if we could manage to define what a filling operator on A is, then we could. Uh, go ahead and implement these type forming operators that we're used to, like products, sums, um, natural numbers, what have you, inside this extensional type theory. Uh, and then when we um, apply the interpretation of the extensional type theory into cubicle sets, we get our kind of external model of hot that we want. Um, but of course, in order to define what a filling operator on the family of types is, we're going to need some information about cubicle sets. We're not just working in bare extensional type theory. We want to add some uh, objects that are specific to cubicle sets that we need to talk about. So um, the most important thing is we need a, a one cube. Um, so we'll postulate that there's some type and that it has two points. These are the two ends of an edge. And um, actually, in the situations where we're, that we're looking at, we can recover the n cube by just taking products of the one cube. So the square is actually the product of the two uh, lines. Um, but sometimes we don't even need to talk about n cubes. And the second thing we really need, and this one is a bit harder to wrap your head around, is a type of subshapes, which 
in the lingo would be a cofibration classifier. And so this is a type, so it's supposed to correspond to a, a cubicle set externally. And I describe what a cubicle set is by saying what its n cubes are and how they're attached to each other. I won't tell you how they're attached to each other, but the n cubes in this thing are supposed to be subshapes of an n cube. So um, this thing is a subshape of a two cube, and so it would be a two cube in this type. Just to clarify this uh, uh, fine type, uh, is this in the hot level or the ETT level? This is in the ETT level. Okay. Yeah, both of these things are in the ETT level. So this corresponds to a context, or is that not right? Um, you mean it corresponds to a context in hot? Yeah. It does, but it's not really a context we're interested in. Okay. Yeah, so these things, we, we won't see them appear literally in hot, or I mean, they appear as contexts because they're types, but we're not. So and you're, you're building the model internally. Yes. That's, that's the future. Yeah. Okay. So, so and we, we describe the filling operators, I mean, because you need probably to define them by induction. Um, okay. No, and that's something cool. And um, that was a part, that was a slide that didn't happen, but I can out. draw it for you. Um, okay, okay. So I will do something. This appears twice. Okay. So here's an example, and um, it's not a filling operator, but it's um, maybe close enough to give you some intuition on how that will work, and then we can do the filling operator if we want to. Um, these things really don't work at all. Yeah. It's like they want to punish you for not using this. So here I'm going to uh, define an operator on types. This counter thing is a function that takes a type and returns a type. And the idea here is I'm going to think of an inhabitant of this as an operator that will fill in any partial cube in the type. So we before we're interested in filling these specially shaped open boxes, but this predicate is going to express that I can just fill any partial cube I want. So in particular, if I have this unfilled in box, okay. so I can define this here. Um, I'm just going to write what I have up there, but then I can point at it. So I'm going to say whenever I have a subshape and whenever I have an element that's defined, or whenever I have a picture of that subshape. A little bit easier to read. Sorry? Ah. Yeah. There? Yeah. Um, and whenever I have. Yeah, so you're writing the equation. Yeah, I'm just writing the same. Yeah, yeah perfect. <laughs> uh, and whenever I have a, a, a picture of that subshape in A, I want to get out two things. So, product. Uh, another non partial, a full element of A, and a function that says whenever I'm in this subshape, this element that I've got agrees with the thing that I started with. So, uh, something I wrote up there doesn't make sense. This U is the name of the evidence I'm in the subshape. So, here I'm using explicitly that. Um, elements of this thing can be regarded as types. And their meaning as types is their sort of the, the fact that I'm in the subshape. So this says, when I'm in the subshape, I have an element of A. And um, being contractible means I can extend that to a tonal element. And um, so because of the way extensional type theory is interpreted in cubicle sets, this is sort of not just a, a statement about points, but lives at every level. And so if I kind of read it at the stage of n-cubes, it says for any subshape of an n-cube and any picture of that subshape, I get an extension. Yep. And this uh, triple equals here, 
uh, this is to be read as equality or definition of equality, or it doesn't matter because it's CPT? Uh, yes, but I probably meant to write equals to A uh, without the triple equals. Yeah, it's just so more yeah. of that slide making. Yeah. If you did this for types in context, would you get trivial vibrations in your? Yes, right. So, um, digression for people formed to develop model categories, I would define um, the predicate as being a trivial vibration or a family of types, just as um, for every element of the context, I am. Or the, the type is contractible at index. So this is something um, uh, yeah, okay, no, I'll get back to that. Um, and besides getting sort of uh, all the cubes here for free in a way, um, this uniformity condition is, is built into the way these things are interpreted. So if I uh, fill a partial thing, and then I look at a face, that thing is also what I would get by um, filling in that partial bit. Okay. Um, so the beautiful picture is kind of troubled by the universe. Um, and so right, the idea of a universe is that it is some collection of some types, not all types, but some of them. Um, and so it should sort of look like uh, the whole world of types, just a bit smaller. Um, and so if I kind of forget about universe levels for a bit, what I want is a type, which uh, in particular, uh, I also want to itself be a con complex, but I didn't write that here. Um, and then I would like it to be the case that elements of this universe, so maps from a context into it, should correspond to um, uh, vibrations, non-vibrations. Um, so it would be nice to say, well, a universe is, or an element of the universe is just a, a type paired with a filling operation. But <coughs> unlike this counter thing, where I could define uh, being a trivial vibration, a family being a trivial vibration as being at every index uh, contractible, there's no um, corresponding way to do this for filling operations. So I can define what it means for a family of types to have a filling structure, but it's not of the form, so it's not just for every point something holds a gamma. And um, Maybe I can try the How am I doing time-wise? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, if I were try to uh, try to do it this way, what I will end up being able to do is fill in boxes in situations that look like this. Um, so I have an open box, and it, it lies over something of one dimension, one dimension lower dimensional in the uh, context. This is A and this is gamma. Um, and that's OK, but it's not everything. So we also want to be able to fill things that lie just over arbitrary boxes in the context. And it turns out that in order to do this, we have to quantify <laughs> over paths in the context. Um, so not just indices, but maps from the interval into this context. And OK, well, we can do that as far as defining what it means to be a vibration and using this as our interpretation of types. But once we get to the universe, um, it becomes problematic because when we define this U, we don't see what context we're going to be mapping from later. Okay, so there's really something fundamentally not pointwise happening here. Um, I guess I should be careful what I say because I don't know 
I mean, there are sort of no-go results about things you could try to do, but there's maybe, I don't know of any result that says you definitely can't define a vibrant universe of vibrant types in um, or no. I think there is. Uh, yes, I think you're right. I mean, I know the result that you're thinking of, and for a second I was thinking it only rules out kind of a a step in the proof rather than the final okay. result, but I have to think about it. Um, okay, but the solution, which um, Lakata, Orton, Pitts, and Spitters came up with in 2018, is to not just work in a, a plain extensional type theory, but something uh, more complicated, a modal type theory. And now the talk becomes a chalk talk. Do you really think it would happen so soon? Yes, it's happening. There's also a fourth rag over there, which works passively as a Right now. So, since I don't have a lot of time, I can avoid coming up with improvised technical stuff on the board. I'll just give a, a quick idea here about this modal approach. So, okay. So, there's the world of cubicle sets. There's the world of sets. And between these things, there are a bunch of um, transformations, functors, whatever you want to call them. Um, so I can treat a set as a discrete cubicle set. I can say, look at the points of a cubicle set, and that's a set. Or Maybe I can uh, quotient my paths. So I start with the points here, and then I make points equal if there exists a path between them. That's another way to go from a cubicle set to a set. And um, so I can um, be inspired by this picture and try and talk about things that don't properly live in cubicle sets but properly live in sets uh, by introducing an operator to the type theory that corresponds to some of these things. And actually it's the, the round trip that takes the zero cubes and then takes them again as a cubicle set that um, we want here. Uh, but it's also important that this exists. Uh, okay. Um, and so, We can hope to say if, um, okay. So I'm going to want to introduce an operator which I'll call flat, which represents this round trip. And so what would be an element 
of flat A when it is a type. Um, well, I can think of this as an element of A, which is not allowed to use certain things from the context. Um, it's supposed to treat this context uh, or I think I won't explain this well. I think we should cut our losses. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I read something nice in my outline, but uh, things always happen. That's why you have to spend a lot of time making the slides, because while you do that, you think, but I didn't get to thinking about this part. Okay. Does it make sense to show us a little bit of the code? Yeah, I should do that. Um, but I, I want to make some conclusions about this thing um, to wrap up. Um, and I, I, so first I should say something about the formalization um, properly, um, as in the technical details. So like I said, this is a formalization in ACTA. And um, it happens to be convenient that we're doing this in ACTA because ACTA has um, a flat modality, which I failed to explain in it. Um, so I think it was actually the, the reason why there is a flat modality in ACTA um, is related to these cubicle models. So it was observed that this was needed and Andrea Vetsasi put it into ACTA and now we have it. It's one of these weird corner features of ACTA. Um, so that's very useful for us. Um, and um, other than that, well, we don't have extensional type theory in the sense that we have a quality reflection, um, but we can uh, turn on Agnes with K flag, which implies that all proofs of equality are at least equal up to propositional equality um, via some fun pattern matching. And um, so can I ask a question? Yep. So just to understand uh, this flat modality, was it related to the trouble with the universe you mentioned, or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, sorry, I kind of failed to make the connection there. So that is the motivation people introduce, flat modality? Yes. I see. Okay. So it's for um, modeling the universe. Basically, um, okay, I can say something that will make sense maybe to you. Okay. And we can talk people um, may suffer. Um, but the important thing, uh, the important feature of cubicle sets that we need to interpret the universe is that exponentiation by the interval has a right adjoint. And this is something that is true externally, but if we um, postulate it internally, it implies that the interval is a point. Uh, so we can't do that. But using the flat modality, we can express that this holds only on the level of um, kind of closed cubicle sets. Yeah. Um, well, at least for those who know, that's helpful. Um, but I wanted to reflect a little bit on, so I'll just pull this up since I thought it was the show. Um, but I wanted to reflect a little bit on the kind of nature of this formalization since we're here to think about formalization. Um, so this is a very bespoke formalization. And every one of these orton pitt style formalizations has been. It's just its own little repository doesn't interact with the rest of the ACTA ecosystem. I think I import the built-in natural numbers, but that's it. Um, and I mean, part of the reason for that is that I'm postulating a bunch of things. So I've got some axioms here. Um, okay, so here's this phi, it's called cough here. Um, and I have a bunch of postulates about shapes that exist. Um, now, of course, I could fix this problem a little bit by taking these axioms and just making them hypotheses. Maybe I bundle them all up in a big record and I assume them at the top of every file. Um, it's more convenient practically to not do this and also I want to use Agda's rewrite rules. Now let me turn some uh, equalities that I postulate into definitional equalities, but I mean in principle that's doable. Um, Can you show what the axioms for the modalities are? Uh, yes, but 
Are they not interesting because they're not interesting flag? because it's just some text that explains that Agda's <laughs> uh, flat modality is a flag that I've turned on. Um, so, but the the kind of larger reason I would say that these things are bespoke is that I mean they're they have a particular interpretation of, of type theory in mind. So. Um, Uh, like if you are in the Agnes Standard Library, I guess you can think of many different interpretations of it, but this has a specific interpretation in mind, and everything that's going on in here has to do mainly with that interpretation. Um, but I think there's, I mean, there's potential here. Parts of this could be generalized and put into, I mean, at, at least all these different uh, formalizations of cubicle type theories and principle pieces of them could be pulled out into some. Um, big library that I would draw from here. Um, and uh, okay, second thing, um, right, so what would be, um, uh, sorting statements. Um, so the other thing about this, I kind of think of it as maybe an insult to what I'm doing and what other people have done, but it's sort of a quick and dirty formalization. Like the, the whole point of this is that it lets us express things in a quick way, um, and it's, it's good for checking stuff. Um, and it's good for specifically checking the interesting parts. But there's a lot that's not checked here, right? The whole interpretation of this type theory into cubicle sets is not part of the formalization. Um, it's just like a, a result from mathematics that we're importing in. Um, importing in the <coughs> sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so what would be really beautiful, but I don't know how practical, would be if there was a way to do an end-to-end -end formalization of this kind, where first we build up an interpretation of, of cubicle sets, or of type theory into cubicle sets, and then we're allowed to work in that type theory. And then we can do this stuff. Um, and I mean, I think that's a big challenge, especially if, like me, you want to use all the convenience features that Agda has to offer, and then these would have to be justified in, in your cubicle set model very uh, precisely. Um, but I mean, I think it's an interesting question. Anyway, um, right, that. And then finally, there's this, this business of modalities that I didn't really get into get to get into. Um, so this, uh, we benefit from the fact that Agda happens to have this one modality built in that does the things that we want. Uh, it turned out that in this equivariant model structure paper, um, we're working in uh, more than these two settings. Um, so I had sets and cubicle sets before. But uh, in this paper, in the main body, you'll see there also appears this other thing, which we call cubicle species. It's uh, some other pre sheaf category. And we do a bunch of work in here and transfer it over to cubicle sets where our model <coughs> eventually lives. Um, and uh, so it would be nice if we could represent that here as well. And my conjecture is that if we had enough uh, modalities corresponding to the like, millions of functors that go between these things, then that might actually be possible. But as it stands, with our one modality, we're kind of limited to working with these two. And um, this is the reason, and I didn't really harp on this earlier, but this is the reason why the development in the appendix is not like a one-to-one -one, um, uh, point by point reinterpretation of what's happening in the main paper. So in the main paper, we kind of do an older construction here and transfer it here and get the equivariant construction. But in the formalization, we're working always here and we have to spell things out a bit more explicitly. And I think you know both these perspectives are nice to have, but it would also be really cool if we could have a big theory with a bunch of modalities. And um, now we're starting to see uh, work on type theories that you can kind of supply with your own personal choice of modalities and, and work in all of them. But on the implementation level, things are still really early there. So, um, you mean like having enough modalities so that you can have 
a universe of equivariant vibrant types inside? Uh, um, so the the point of the modalities would be that so for example. Um, to construct the universe in here in the paper, we first construct a universe here, uh -huh. and then we pull it over using these functors in some way. So that's the kind of thing that I would like to do. I think we're already in the.